focus on battlefield interpretation. He currently serves as president of the Frederick County Civil War Roundtable and is a certified battlefield guide for Antietam and Harper's Ferry and is now a park ranger at the Monocacy National Battlefield in Frederick, Maryland. <coughs> so we look forward to hearing that program next month. Uh, and for those who are here in person, uh, uh, our speaker tonight, Mr. Kirkwood, is, will have books available for uh, purchase and for signing. Um, and also we do have our uh, basket over there for people who want to contribute to the Roundtable's uh, speaker fund. Uh, but uh, now we're going to introduce tonight's speaker, Mr. Kirk Ron Kirkwood. Uh, he's going to be speaking again about the George Spangler farm. And a little background about him. He's uh, says he's retired after a 40 year career as an editor and writer of newspapers. Uh, he is a, <clears throat> he's won numerous state, regional, and national writing editing awards. Uh, he, he's a Michigan native and graduate of Central Michigan University. And he has been a Gettysburg Foundation guide at the George Spangler Farm site since it opened in 2013. He lives here locally in Manchester Township with his wife of 44 years, Barbara, who's also attending here tonight. Uh, and she's a retired first grade teacher here locally at Leaders Height Elementary School in the Dallas Town School District. And both of their daughters also graduated from Dallas Town High School. So uh, again, we want to welcome back Mr. Kirkwood as he talks about the George Spangler Farm, which he uh, argues is uh, most important of the, the farms on the Gettysburg battlefield, and we'll be talking about the military significance of that battlefield uh, in his presentation tonight. And again, he's going to be talking uh, based on his book here, <coughs> for Human Endurance, and that, that book will be available for purchase here this evening, or for those who can attend this evening, it is also available at the History Center and their bookshop. So without further ado, Mr. Ron Kirkwood. Thanks, Scott. No push. No push here. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now we're good. Now we're good to go. Thank you for having me again. This is the second time I was here in 2019 and I gave an overview and uh, I'm just really happy to be back here tonight since we've lived in York for a long, long time. Um, and this is only the second time I've given this talk on the military importance of the George Spangler farm. So I'm excited about that too. Uh, thank you for coming here. Thank you for those on Zoom and on Facebook. I'm sorry, Kathy can't be here tonight, but I look forward to uh, catching up with her again sometime. Um, without a doubt and without comparison, George Spangler owned the perfect farm for the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg to the point that I argue that it's the most important farm in the Battle of Gettysburg. First, there's the farm's location as indicated in gray on the map. The farm is close to the left flank of the line, the center of the line, and the right flank of the line. Center, right. Then there's the size. This farm is huge at 166 acres, and it's large enough to hold massive numbers of men and machinery in reserve directly behind the line and within quick reach of the fighting. And there are the roads, Granite Schoolhouse Lane, cuts right through the heart of the Spangler Farm, marked by the Blue Arrow, heads directly to the battlefield while also connecting the Baltimore Pike and the Tony Town Road. The lane was not even a mile long, and it was only a rough farm path then, but it could not have been more crucial. 
Blacksmith Shop Road is marked by the blue X's and leads directly from Grand Schoolhouse Lane through Spangler to the Round Tops, which would prove crucial on July 2nd. George Meade got to the battle late, but not too late to see all of this about Spangler. He put the Fifth Corps and then he put the Sixth Corps in reserve on and next to Spangler. Henry Slocum put his 12th Corps headquarters on Powers Hill. which was mainly Spangler land. Artillery Chief Henry Hunt and Artillery Reserve Commander Robert O. Tyler placed the Artillery Reserve at Spangler, or at least they were ordered to do so by me. Other farms saw horrific and decisive combat and were literally destroyed, including the farms of George's half-brother Henry Spangler, half-sister Susanna Spangler Herbst, and his father Abraham but not one single farm matched George Spangler's in setting up that union victory at Gettysburg. On July 2nd and July 3rd, George's farm was one of the absolute keys to the battle. And here's why. There we go. <laughs> these, these photos show where the Union Artillery Reserve camped on the Tawny Town Road just south of Gettysburg on the night of July 1st. Meade was still in the Tawny Town area early in the evening on July 1st when he ordered about eight of the Artillery Reserve's 19 light batteries to be sent to Gettysburg immediately. So Artillery Reserve Commander Tyler left at sundown with the 1st Regular and 4th Volunteer Brigades, arriving for the night, according to Tyler, on the Tawny Town Road, which placed them as shown here in the fields along Rock Creek and just south of the modern day village of Barlow. There are still fields and good flat ground next to the creek on both sides of the road as is shown here. Where I'm standing when I took these photos is 3.5 miles south of the Tawny Town Road intersection with Grant Schoolhouse Lane. So those two artillery reserve brigades got pretty close on the night of July 1st, despite their late start. The batteries that camped here got up early on July 2nd and they reached George Spangler's farm by 8 a.m. The other 11 batteries had a 3 a.m. July 2nd reveille and left Tawny Town at early dawn, arriving at Spangler at between 10.30 a.m and early afternoon, depending upon where they were in the procession. There we go. So by 2 p.m. on July 2nd, the 106 cannons, 2,300 men, 2,300 horses of the Army of the Potomac Artillery Reserve were resting in position and filling much of the George Spangler farm and awaiting orders and the fight. This photo is not of one artillery with the artillery reserve at Gettysburg, but this is just one Civil War battery and shows how many men and horses it takes to operate six cannons. So imagine 19 of these same size batteries covering Spangler land and spilling off of it at 2 p.m. on July 2nd. Traveling with the final 11 batteries to the Spangler property from Tawny Town on July 2nd was the artillery ammunition train of about 100 wagons and more than 600 additional horses and mules, making a loud, powerful, miles-long parade of artillery, animals, men, and wagons. This train provided artillery ammunition to all of the Union Army at Gettysburg. Captain James F. Huntington, commander of the Reserve's 3rd Volunteer, Volunteer Brigade, said the Reserve formed an imposing column, exciting the wonder of the inhabitants who gathered at every crossroad to gaze on the strange and warlike spectacle. The artillery reserve set up mainly on the fields behind and west of the Spangler's barn as shown in the photo at left, which was taken from the bank of the Spangler barn looking west toward the battlefield. Those trees in the picture were not there in 1863, but there was a wall 
where the trees are that still stands today. The ammunition train was placed along Grand Schoolhouse Lane in the area of where the house in the top right photo stands today and the fields around this house. Now, Captain John Bigelow's 9th Massachusetts Battery would see heavy work in the hours ahead, but before it ended up fighting for its life on Wheatfield Road and the Trossel Farm, it went into part on George Spangler's property. Quoting Sergeant Levi W. Baker of the 9th Massachusetts, we turn to the right, referring to onto Granite Schoolhouse Lane from the Tawny Town Road, through those narrow and rough roads, and again to the right, into a field west of Spangler's Barn going in park before noon. We were one half mile east of the Tawny Town Road. Spangler's barn was taken for a hospital and a large number of rebel wounded were there. Some of the boys went there and saw them. Our teams were watered. We were soon fed and dinner eaten and we watched the increasing artillery fire. Lust passed the time till about 4 p.m. So the guns and wagons of Bigelow's 9th Massachusetts stopped directly behind and close to the Spangler barn right there. Now this congestion of the overflowing artillery park at Spangler was an impressive sight. Major Charles Morse of the 2nd Massachusetts 12th Corps said, in open fields west of the Baltimore Pike in rear of our lines were the parks of ammunition trains and headquarters wagons with their hundreds of mules and attendants of all kinds that always gather about a wagon camp. Near this camp was the park of the artillery reserve. So in addition to the farm size, proximity to the line and the roads, the fact that it was almost surrounded by hills and ridges and patches of timber turned out to be an advantage because it provided a bit of a hiding place from the Confederates. Some officers still worried though about the ammunition train being overrun, but there was a breakthrough in the line on Culp's Hill or Cemetery Ridge. Now, also arriving with this artillery parade were seven companies of the 4th New Jersey Infantry to guard the ammunition train. The 4th New Jersey set up at the site, the bottom right photo, at the intersection of Blacksmith Shop Road and Granite Schoolhouse Lane, pretty much right in the center of Spangler Lane. The artillery reserve is actually one of the last arrivals at Spangler and was only joining and expanding the crowd there. This map shows how Spangler land was used at various times on July 2nd and 3rd. The first to arrive was the 11th Corps Hospital, right here around the Spangler's barn, house, summer kitchen, number 10 on the map. The hospital occupied uh, other outbuildings as well as much of the land directly around those buildings as well. And it forced George Spangler and his wife and his four kids to live crammed together for five weeks and two days in one upstairs bedroom amid summer heat, flies, a chamber pot, and the smell and sounds of wounded and dying men in their house and in the nearby barn. By July 5th, about 1,900 wounded and dying men were in this hospital. So I'm going to digress just for this slide to talk about the 11th Corps Hospital. Surgeon Daniel, G. Britton of Westchester said, the wounded soon began to pour in, giving us such sufficient occupation that from the 1st of July till the afternoon of the 5th, I was not absent from the hospital more than once and then but for an hour or two. Very hard work it was too, and little sleep fell to our share. Four operating tables were going night and day. Many of them were hurt in the most shocking manner by shells. My experience at Chancellorsville was nothing compared to this, and I never wish to see such another sight. For myself, I think I never was more exhausted. Amputations took place under the poor bay in front of the bar. Private William Sollerton, age 19, 75th Ohio said, at the doorway, I saw a huge stack of amputated arms and legs a stack as high as my head, the most horrible thing I ever saw in my life. I wish I had never seen it, I sickened. Confederate General Louis Armistead died in the Spangler Summer Kitchen on July 5th. Private George Nixon of the 73rd Ohio died at Spangler. He would become the great grandfather of President Richard M. Nixon. Both men were temporarily buried in the Spangler's orchard. 
General Francis Barlow was treated in the Spangler's house and he survived. 111th Corps ambulances. Here and here. And the hundreds of men and horses attached to them occupied the Spangler's wheat fields as shown on the map when they weren't at East Cemetery Hill and elsewhere on the battlefield. The Spanglers owned three-fourths of Power Hill. And Nathaniel Leitner owned the rest. And General Slocum set up his 12th headquarters at the base and top of the hill, not long after the 11th Corps Hospital went to work, a half mile away on the southern portion of Spangler land on July 1st. Slocum remained headquartered there until the army left Gettysburg on July 10th. He would be joined on that hill by the Signal Corps with their flags waving, and for a while overnight on the 1st into the 2nd by a 12th Corps Brigade, which was there to serve as a line of defense in case of a disastrous retreat down the Baltimore Pike from Cemetery Hill and to protect the Army's supply line to Westminster. Batteries B and L, 2nd U.S. Artillery, 1st Brigade Cavalry Corps, they're right here. They arrive at 5.30 a.m. July 2nd, and they remain in reserve along Granite Schoolhouse Lane for most of the next two days. George Spangler sold the plot of land, shown in the bottom right photo, to the federal government for $75 in 1890, and the monument remains today. George Sykes' Fifth Corps was next to arrive at Spangler, getting there late morning after a most of the night march from Spangler. Here's the Fifth Corps. This is my last hospital diversion, and we'll get back to the military. Finally, a major note on July 2nd was the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital at Granite Schoolhouse, marked by the X on the map, almost in the middle of George Spangler's farm. The 1st Division set up its hospital in what was then mainly open fields between the school and the western side of Powers Hill. Sadly, as you can see, the photo shows what those open fields of 1863 look like today. It's an overgrown mess, and no effort has been made by the Park Service to make it look like 1863 when these fields hosted wounded and dying men of this important hospital. Nor is, this, is the site of this hospital marked by a sign, as it should be like so many other division hospitals are around the battlefield. First Division, Second Corps Hospital at Granite Schoolhouse closed 24 hours after it opened because it was being battered by Confederate overshots from the pre pickets charge cannonade. But this was a major and intense hospital during its short life. This hospital served hundreds of men who fought at the Wheatfield and Rose Woods. This was the hospital for the famous Fighting Irish Brigade. These were the men who were granted general absolution shortly before the battle by Father Corby, thus clearing their path to heaven. This is the hospital where Father Corby worked. It also was the hospital of Chaplain John Henry Wilbrand Stuckenberg of the 145th Pennsylvania, who went on to become known worldwide as a religious scholar, and he is buried with his wife Mary in Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg. With Chaplain Stuckenberg and Corby, this Spangler Hospital had two of the most highly respected, deeply caring, gifted, and renowned religious leaders of their time. The mortally wounded General Zook was treated at this hospital before dying a day later on the Baltimore Pike. Colonel Edward Cross died here. So did Lieutenant George A. Woodruff, Commander of Battery I, 1st U.S. Artillery, 2nd Corps Artillery Brigade. If you combine the 1,900 wounded at the 11th Corps Hospital with the hundreds of wounded from the Wheatfield and Rosewoods fights who were treated at Grant Schoolhouse, then the Spanglers had hundreds more wounded men on their property than Gettysburg had residents. But because this site is such a mess and because there is no sign, most people drive by it today with no idea that something important in the Battle of Gettysburg happened here. 
Each of the Union Infantry Corps at Gettysburg had their own artillery batteries, totaling about 200 cannons between the seven corps. These cannons went where their corps went, but the artillery reserve added another whole third of power with 106 more cannons. Plus, the artillery reserve cannons didn't have to go where an infantry corps went. These were crucial, nimble utility players that could be quickly plugged into the line anywhere they were needed and be counted on to perform well. And that's just what Hunt and Tyler did with the mass of men and animals that were awaiting instructions at Spangler when Sickles told me at the Trossel farm, I shall need more artillery. Meade replied, send for all you want to the artillery reserve. So by early evening on July 2nd, 18 of the 19 artillery reserve batteries had left Spangler and gone into the fight. Only the second Connecticut light battery remained at Spangler that day. Major Morris of the second Massachusetts said, as the battle went on, batteries were frequently detached and went bounding away to the support of the fighting line with their horses at full run. The artillery reserve left Spangler, Spangler and fought all along Wheatfield Road at the southern edge of the Trossel Farm, all over the Trossel Farm, the Plum Run Line, the Kadori Farm, Cemetery Hill, East Cemetery Hill, and on the Spangler's own power hill. The artillery reserve even fought hand to hand with ramrods on East Cemetery Hill. And this famous image of the dead horses in the Trossel Yard are Ninth Massachusetts horses that were at Spangler only a couple of hours before they were killed in close combat. Bigelow in the Ninth Massachusetts paid a high price by the time it escaped Trossel and returned to Spangler that night, suffering eight dead, 17 wounded, two captured, plus 45 horses killed and 15 more wounded. The Ninth Massachusetts lost more men in a single day after rushing out from Spangler than any other artillery reserve battery lost in two days at Gettysburg. Ninth Massachusetts Bugler and Medal of Honor recipient, Charles W. Reed, who made this drawing at the top of the page of his battery at Trossel, wrote home, congratulating me on passing through the severest fought battle of the war in perfect safety. Such a shrieking, hissing, seething, I never dreamed was imaginable. It seemed as though it must be the work of the very devil himself. The Ninth Massachusetts will always hold a special place in my heart because when a few members of the battery returned to Gettysburg in 1884 to place their three monuments on the battlefield, they parked their carriage at Spangler so they could retrace their 1863 steps from the farm to Wheatfield Road. While there, Private Richard Holland of the Ninth drew these two images of the Spangler's farm and the one of Granite Schoolhouse. Happily and exceedingly fortunately for me, Holland's descendants turned over the drawings to the Park Service in 2017. The Park Service told me about them. And just like that, I suddenly had the cover and back cover for my book, plus an important drawing of Granite Schoolhouse. Most artillery reserve batteries stayed in their position in the line, but some returned to Spangler on the night of July 2nd, including the entire 1st Volunteer Brigade. Artillery wagons from all over the battlefield descended on Spangler through the night of July 2nd into July 3rd to reload. The ammunition train was placed in this Spangler field in the photo at left with a modern day house and Powers Hill in the distance. There would be little sleep and little quiet at Spangler that night. General Hunt said, the night of the second was devoted in great part to repairing damages, replenishing the ammunition chests, and reducing and reorganizing such batteries as had lost so many men and horses as to be, made, be unable efficiently to work the full number of guns. 70 of the ammunition train's 100 wagons were emptied in this field overnight July 2nd. Those 70 wagons were then withdrawn from Spangler and sent farther to the rear on the morning of July 3rd. The ammunition train carried 23,833 rounds when it arrived at Spangler and it had 4,694 rounds left when the battle ended. 
Much of this was happening overnight. On the second end of the third, while 11 Corps ambulances rushed from East Cemetery Hill to Spangler after the evening fighting there, there would be no break at any point on this farm on this night. The traffic and noise from the batteries and ammunition train and the two hospitals must have been intense beyond anything that I can imagine today. <clears throat> Excuse me, back to the Spangler farm uh, map. And back to the Fifth Corps. Commander George Sykes spent part of the afternoon of July 2nd on Powers Hill with Slocum, establishing his headquarters there for a while as men rested for a few hours. Meade ordered Sykes in late afternoon of the 2nd to get the Fifth Corps to the area around the wheat field in what is now Little Round Top ASAP. And once again, the Corps placement at Spangler, Booker, and Musser that morning by Meade made critical dividends in determining the outcome of the fight on that part of the line. Part of the fifth rushed down Granite Schoolhouse Lane, took a left turn at the X on the map, and cut across fields on their way to the fight. The rest of the Corps dashed down Blacksmith Shop Road. Said the fifth Corps' Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain of the timing of the 20th Maine's arrival and placement on Little Round Top after leaving Spangler. My formation was scarcely complete when the artillery was replaced by a vigorous infantry assault. The fifth Corps wasn't gone long before the sixth Corps moved into the exact Spangler, Booker, and Musser property that the fifth had just abandoned. But the sixth was quickly ordered to the front and it got there fast by using Granite Schoolhouse Lane. Finally, later on July 2nd, the first division of the 12th Corps used Little Granite Schoolhouse Lane to rush from Culp's Hill to the line. General George Meade, had his main street at Gettysburg, and it was a rutted farm path whose name would become Granite Schoolhouse Lane. Colonel William B. Mosby, 1st Maryland Potomac Home Brigade, 12th Corps, said the 1st Division moved down Granite Schoolhouse Lane, quote, in a quick step, breaking at times into a double quick over the small wagon road leading from the Baltimore Pike to the Tawny Town Road under a broiling sun. We found this narrow road filled with Sickles men seeking hospitals and bearing every conceivable kind of ghastly wounds. Some with one leg shot off, some with one arm shot away, carried and helped along by their less wounded comrades, all covered with blood, sweat, and the black grimy smoke and dust and dirt of the battle. When we first met this spectacle, we turned in our saddles to watch the effect on our men, whether it unnerved unnerv them. The sight we met was of every man unhitching his blanket, throwing it away in the road, and breaking into a quicker step. Captain Frederick Winkler of the 26th Wisconsin said, if they had broken our lines, all would have been lost. And sometimes they came so very near, but our generals were watchful. And whenever our lines were closely pressed, wherever they were giving away there, just before the critical moment arrived, we would see the serried ranks of the reserve march up and reinforce our lines and drive the rebels back. If a doctor or nurse at one of the two Spanglers could have taken a 10 minute break and stood in the middle of the Spanglers farm at the site of that big blue circle in late afternoon on July 2nd, they would have been constantly turning their heads to watch infantry, artillery, and ambulances rush past, most going to the front or to the hospitals, but some retreating through the farm as many of Sickles' men did. All of this was going on as Confederate artillery overshots pelted the property. The Spangler's farm wasn't a part of the line, but it was overrun, it was trampled, it was shoulder to shoulder, and it was frenzied. At about 4 a.m. on July 3rd, Union artillery stretching from Spangler property on Powers Hill to northward on the Baltimore Pike, opened fire on Confederates on Culp's Hill. The 12th Corps wanted the land back, but the Confederates seized when two 12th Corps divisions abandoned the hill on the night of the 2nd. 11th Corps Major General Oliver O. Howard was resting in Evergreen Cemetery, a tombstone for a pillow when the bombardment began. He said, the roaring of the cannon seemed like thunder. 
The artillery fire was even loud on the other side of Gettysburg to the north, according to resident Jane Smith, who said, may I never again be roused to the consciousness of a newborn day by such fearful sounds. This seemed almost like the crashing of worlds. So the last serious day of fighting, the greatest battle ever fought on American soil, and the last day that the Confederates truly had legitimate hopes of winning this war was underway. And this day's fighting began with artillery fire from the George Spangler farm. Chaplain Stuckenberg, who was working through the night in that open field at Granite Schoolhouse below Powers Hill, climbed the hill to watch the action and said he watched Slocum, quote, in person directing the fire. Confederates probably along the Emmitsburg Road responded with artillery fire of their own and their shots landed directly on the Spangler's farm, putting everyone and everything there in danger. I'll tell you that was a hot place for a few minutes, hotter than it was in the front. Private El Eldridge B. Platt of the 2nd Connecticut Light Battery said of a Spangler field. But I tell you, we did not stay there long. Said the 2nd Connecticut's Private William B. Sniffen, they bid us good morning about four o'clock with a shell, which we did not think much of until several more followed in quick succession raining. Shells among our guns and over our heads in a manner not at all agreeable. We got out pretty quick. We were ordered to the front. So just to be clear on Sniffen's quote, the men of the 2nd Connecticut Light Battery were ordered for their safety to go to the front line because it would be safer there than in the Spangler fields and they were in. Most of the artillery reserve batteries that spent the night of July 2nd at Spangler then hustled to Cemetery Ridge. The few that were left after that were in place in the line and available to help before Pickett's charge. The artillery reserve and the ammunition train were done to the Spanglers property by mid-afternoon July 3rd. The ammunition train left during the cannonade for a safer place along the Baltimore Pike and the batteries stayed in their positions along the line after the battle until they left town on July 5th. The artillery reserve had done crucial service in its two days with the Spanglers convenient farm as its base repeatedly being called on to plug holes in almost every part of the line as other batteries were knocked out and infantry fell back and earning praise from commanders of both armies. Major, Major Thomas W. Osborne, commander of the 11th Corps Artillery, Artillery Brigade said the artillery of the reserve proved all that could be expected or even asked of it. Without their assistance, I do not conceive how I could have maintained the position we held. I feel most thankful for their assistance in the very willing and cordial manner in which it was rendered. The Confederate artillery barrage next prior to Pickett's charge to damage at Spangler and cause an exodus, just like the early morning artillery shots had done. Ammunition train commander, Lieutenant Cornelius Gillette said, a mule in one of the teams was struck by a solid shot and killed and many of the animals became so unmanageable that there was a danger of a stampede. Teamsters and others took off on a stampede of their own to the rear of the Spangler's property, prompting fear among the wounded in the orchard and fields that, quote, they would be trampled to death, unquote, according to Private Edson Ames of the 154th New York. A surgeon said a Confederate shell landed within 20 feet of the back of the Spangler's barn and forced hospital workers to evacuate the wounded. <coughs> Surgeons of the 1st Division 2nd Corps Hospital at Granite Schoolhouse in the middle of Spangler land got so sick of the steady Confederate overshots on July 3rd that they moved most of their hospital farther behind the line and out of distance of the Confederate artillery by the end of the day, as did literally every other major Army of the Potomac Hospital except that of the 11th Corps on the southern end of the Spangler's farm. To add to, our to add to our other difficulties, said Dr. Justin Brunel, who was overseeing the moving of the wounded, for a while we were seriously threatened to be run down by a stampede of pack mules, saddle horses, army wagons, prisoners, and stragglers. It required great exertions to render this stampede less dangerous to the helpless wounded than the shells of the evening. Before and as the Confederates charged, 
frightened Union men ran down Granite Schoolhouse Lane in retreat, but they ran into a human roadblock in the Fort, New Jersey, which as I mentioned earlier, was stationed on Spangler property at the intersection of Blacksmith Shop Road and Granite Schoolhouse Lane to guard the ammunition train and serve as provost guards. Major Charles Ewing of the 4th New Jersey said that as the cannonade began, quote, fugitives from the field began to rush toward the rear, rear upon the road which I was stationed, referring to Granite Schoolhouse Lane. I immediately deployed across the road and into the woods on my right flank with fixed bayonets, where I stopped and reorganized between 400 and 500 men, whom I turned over to General Patrick. And as soon as the panic subsided, I resumed my former duty with the ammunition train, which was not again interrupted during the battle. Most everyone had a different role in the Battle of Gettysburg and the fourth New Jersey's important role was now complete. This role just happened to take place entirely behind the line at Spangler. That's looking south on the Baltimore Pike. Army of the Potomac Provost Marshal Brigadier General Marcina R. Patrick was on George Spangler property at Grant Schoolhouse Lane, a couple of hundred yards behind these trees in the photo, with Major Ewing at the time to pick up stragglers, collect and guard Confederate prisoners, and be the police chief of the Army. I had my hands full with those that broke to the rear, Patrick said, but well, we succeeded in checking the disorder and organized a guard of stragglers to keep nearly 2,000 prisoners all safe. General Patrick also had a checkpoint here where the photo is on the Baltimore Pike at the base of Powers Hill. There as Confederate prisoners were being moved to the South past this checkpoint, Patrick's men stopped those whom they considered to be too seriously wounded to travel a couple of miles down the road to the prisoner holding area across from the, what the locals called White Church. The prisoners who were pulled out were sent across the road from the Spangler's property to a hospital at McAllister's Hill. General Meade also retreated down Grant Schoolhouse Lane to Spangler with his headquarters and everyone at the Leicester House in danger under the July 3rd pre pickets charge bombardment. So he joined Slocum on Powers Hill, which had fewer trees on top of the hill and a good view of the battlefield. Meade set up his headquarters at the base of Powers Hill on Spangler land on the evening of July 3rd in and around this patch of trees shown in the photo that the National Park Service calls the George Spangler Grove. Tents were spread out on George Spangler and Nathaniel Leitner property along the Baltimore Pike around the present day Slocum headquarters marker. Cincinnati Gazette reporter Light White Law Reed was there when Meade arrived from the battlefield here at the Spanglers on the evening of July 3rd. And he said, General Meade rode up calm as ever, called for paper and aids. He had orders already to issue. The band came marching in over the hillside on the evening air as notes floated out, significant melody hailed to the chief. Reporter Reed said of the morning here, the general had a little wall tent in which he was dictating orders and receiving dispatches. General Ingalls, the chief quartermaster, had his writing table in the open end of a covered wagon. The rest, majors, Colonels, generals, and all had slept on the ground and were now standing about the campfires. Meade had to leave Spangler and move inside on the Baltimore, somewhere else on the Baltimore Pike when the violent thunderstorms hit on July 4th. Meade was then personally done with Spangler property, the land that had served him and his army so crucially well. Like with the site of the Granite Schoolhouse Hospital, low just up the lane. I think there needs to be a sign or a marker here showing me second Gettysburg headquarters at Powers Hill. The only army representatives left on the fields around the Spangler's barn by the afternoon of July 4th was the 11th Corps Hospital and its 100 ambulances, which searched the battlefield and picked up wounded men for two days after the fight. The Spangler survived the battle unharmed and went on to live long lives. But like others in Adams County, their property did not fare well. Their crops were leveled or consumed. Most, if not all, stone walls and fences that crisscrossed the farm were torn down by artillery batteries and infantry racing to the front. The fields that the Spangler's had spent 
Previous 15 years nurturing, we're now a muddy wasteland of wagon tracks, human and animal waste, and crushed crops. But at least George did better than half brother Henry Spangler and half sister Susanna Spangler Herbst, whose farms were part of the battle and whose barns were burned down. Years after the war, George filed three damaged claims totaling about $5,000, but he was only awarded $90 and it's believed that all $90 went to its Washington, D.C. attorney. In denying the claims, U.S. Quarter Master Agent Z.F. Nye said, the government of the United States is no more responsible for bringing on the battle fought there than it would have been had a tornado passed over that country, causing as widespread destruction as did that terrible engagement. That situation was his misfortune. It's actually a Kinsley construction photo because they did a lot of, they did the remodeling of the house. It's just beautiful. Six of the seven Army of the Potomac Infantry Corps at Gettysburg were placed on or passed through the Spangler's farm at some point during the battle. The second Corps had a division hospital, ambulances, and some of his men bivouacked on Spangler land. Many men of the third Corps retreated through Spangler on Granite Schoolhouse Lane. The 5th Corps and the 6th Corps bivouacked on Spangler and rushed through the farm to the line. And the 6th Corps had infantry on Powers Hill and artillery in a western Spangler field. The 11th Corps hospital was at Spangler. And the 12th Corps had its headquarters and artillery there and used Granite Schoolhouse Lane. Only the 1st Corps did not use Spangler, but even the 1st Corps had some of its men treated in the 11th Corps hospital. The Signal Corps used Spangler as did two batteries of Cavalry Corps artillery, the Provost Marshal, the artillery reserve of the entire army and its ammunition train. Even the commanding general used Spangler for his second headquarters. Like many in and around Gettysburg, the Spangler sacrificed much, much during and after the battle, but perhaps more than any other farm, their sacrifice played an unmatched military role in winning that battle. Thank you so much for having me back here in New York tonight. It means a lot. Thank you. If you're on Zoom or Facebook and you'd like to get a copy of the book, these are some of the ways, although the, I say the hardcover up there, but the hardcovers are just about gone, two editions. So it's basically in a paperback in an audiobook and Kindle. And um, anybody part of the Civil War Roundtable, the York Civil War Roundtable? I often take groups on tours, personal tours of the farm. So if we can set something up uh, for a tour just for your group, just let me know and uh, we'll work something out. They usually last about an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, any questions? Go ahead. When Stuckenberg was surrounded by Methodists, what religion was he? Lutheran. Huh? And that, that's what he named his diary. I'm so, surrounded by Methodists. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's a tip off of what most of the rep, the preachers were, the Battle of Gettysburg. When people ask, um, you mind repeating the question? Sure. Just to make sure it's good. She asked, um, why Chaplain Stuckenberg said, I'm surrounded by Methodists. Well, it's because when he wrote his diary, uh, he was a Lutheran and he was mainly other, only uh, Methodist ministers around him. With the rehabilitation projects that they were uh, part of been doing over the past several years, plans that you know of for power sales there with the um, they cleared a bunch of trees on power sale a few years ago. I know they have more to do. I haven't heard if that's in their immediate plans. Uh, the Gettysburg Foundation at the moment doesn't have to have plans to do those trees because Gettysburg Foundation owns the Spangler Farm and the National Park Service owns the land on the north side of Granite Schoolhouse, including Powers Hill. 
So right now the Gettysburg Foundation is using most of its money to help the National Park Service with its projects like the Culp's Hill restoration and the Little Round Top restoration. So hopefully when uh, those are done, um, they can refocus their effort a little bit. My problem with the Granite Schoolhouse and their problem with the Granite Schoolhouse is it wasn't a part of the battle. So they're less inclined to spend money to, to rehab and turn it into 1863 if it wasn't a part of the battle. I just think it's a special place. These were the guys from the wheat field. This was Father Corby, this was Chaplain Stuckenberg. This was a major hospital. You know, everybody hears about the wheat field fight, but nobody knows what happened to them after the wheat field fight. Well, they went to Granite Schoolhouse in the middle of the George Spangler Farm. So maybe put up a marker there or something. Um, I actually think there are some groups out there that the Park Service would allow it, would be willing to clean up, clean off one of these fields and then maintain it and take care of it. So that that's maybe down the road. Number of patients at Granite Schoolhouse, um, the Army wasn't sure because that was the second of four hospitals for these four guys. They had to keep moving back because of artillery overshots. Uh, the first hospital, I think, was on Tiny Town Road, it was a George or William Patterson farm. Then it was Granite Schoolhouse, then it was the mill, then it was the second core hospitals at the Jacob Sports Farm. I think there were eight to 900 men at the Granite Schoolhouse Hospital. And I have plans once the National Archives in DC opens fully to go down there and get every single one of the First Division Second Corps casualty, but with the asterisk that a few of these guys probably weren't at Granite Schoolhouse. They might have turned into the hospital when it was at the, at the mill. But I'm guessing eight to 900. They had 1,200 casualties. The first division did. We have a question on Facebook uh, regarding your staying with compensation. Uh, you have, I mean, for, for students of the Civil War, I mean, it's not, this is not a rare event that, that people, and people that were devastated across North County often got absolutely nothing. Uh, but you talked to, did you talk about the lack of compensation for farmers? This was a big sore point for Adams County residents to the point that uh, not getting compensation for their damages after the battle to the point that they formed a committee to try to figure out what they could do to, um, to, to get some compensation. And it didn't really end up helping at all. Randomly, some farms got compensated. Um, George's son-in-law, Herbst, this is the Herbst farm where Reynolds was shot and killed. That, uh, George's sister lived on that, was the wife there. He got a couple thousand dollars. And I heard a couple others got a couple thousand dollars too. I don't know how the quartermaster decided. Um, I think George got $90 because he was given a receipt for $90 of, of hay. I think having a receipt might have made a difference, but how many receipts were handed out? I don't know. I mean, Henry Spangler, his barn was burned down. Susanna Spangler Herbst's barn was burned down. Some of them couldn't overcome this. George was a man of means. He rebuilt and even added on to his house after the battle. Uh, like the Bliss Farm, they were so devastated, they just sold and moved away. So I think receipts. I don't think that many receipts were given out that they helped. Does the foundation owe the Granite Schoolhouse was located, or is that on the military farm? That's right across the road from the foundation land. Granite Schoolhouse Lane divides the Gettysburg Foundation land, which is a George Spangler farm. And then the north side of Grant Schoolhouse Lane, that's all National Park Service land now. Um, so Grant Schoolhouse is the site of it is currently on National Park Service land, as is George's Powers Hill, that's National Park Service. There's nothing left of the schoolhouse except in the winter when there's not so much underbrush, you can go in and kind of see 
the foundation, bits and pieces of it, but it's not the kind of foundation you would expect. It's just stones. Uh, the National Park Service is very protective of it. They say it's an archeological site and they don't even really want people to know exactly where it is. Um, I think maybe somewhere on Grand Schoolhouse Lane, we can put up something without telling people exactly. And I think we could, the school itself wasn't even really used for a hospital. It was used as a medical headquarters for the, for the head, head guys of the second corps. Uh, the hospital was the field between the schoolhouse and Powers Hill. So I think it would be great if they could clear off that field and make it look like it did in 1863. This was a tough hospital. Most hospitals, even in, in Gettysburg, had buildings, they had houses, they had churches, they had schools, they had warehouses, they had barns. There was nothing at Grant Schoolhouse. They weren't in the building. They were operated on outside in the woods and in the field, and then they were laid in the, in the field after they were operated on. That's a tough hospital. Uh, I think it's, I don't know of many that, that were worse than that at Gettysburg. So uh, that's why I'd like to see it honored. I don't know if it ever will be, but I will kind of gently nudge on for a while see what happens. The earliest paint brought back was it Lee's stay where it, for the first time it was shown about the schoolhouse run and then we uh, went down for the Marlies uh, two towers were pretty good. What's the earliest map where it showed that? No, I know that the the Union Army was using an 1858 map of Adams County during the battle that didn't have Grant Schoolhouse Road on it, Lane. It, I think it was just like a, a wagon path. So they were surprised. I have a comment in my book about one general not knowing if it was a road that was already there or that they made. So again, they were operating blindly. That map didn't have Blacksmith Shop Road on it either. So they discovered those two roads once they got there. Uh, we have a question on Zoom from MJ. Um, I was wondering how long Armistead and Hancock were at the, I guess at the hospital at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Um, okay. After he's wounded, during Pickett's charge, Hancock refused to be moved from the field until he felt like he had all of his communications issued. But then he, when he finally allowed it, they were moving in, they stopped him here, Grant Schoolhouse, I think, to write more communications. Um, I don't know how long he was there. Armistead is right here. And it's thought, that's one quarter of a mile from here to here. They're on the same property. Um, both of them got to Spangler late. The ambulances were all out running. Uh, Hancock didn't want to be moved and then he had to wait for an ambulance and um, Armistead had to wait for an ambulance. And once they got out there, the roads were gridlocked because there's ambulances going like crazy. So they probably got there six, seven, eight o'clock as late as that, that night. Now, how long they were together not knowing they were together. I don't know, it really depends upon how, how long Hancock stayed at Granite Schoolhouse, but it makes me kind of sad that Hancock was there and Armistead was there and they didn't know. Go ahead, Mike. With all the activity and just a few roads um, and with ambulances, to get wounded to the hospital, but I would imagine with the movement of the artillery to be the most uh, important thing for the state of the military, despite the fact they had wounded soldiers. How much do you think occurred as far as just crossing the land and not using the land a lot or, or a lot? Um, like indicating right here. Um, the fifth core, part of the fifth core. The ninth Massachusetts is their way down here. They're the ones who fought at Trossel. 
they didn't use the road uh, to get out to the wheat field road. They went straight through like this. So I don't know exactly who did it when, but I know there was a lot of it. I mean, the roads there weren't that great anyway. And there were fewer trees, as you said. Yeah, but um, they did have to knock down some walls. Because look at the wall, wall, walls. So once they got those walls cleared out. That's why I asked because, uh, you know, I'm sure they were knocking walls, but uh, and and charting their own path just because of the speed at which yeah. they had to go. Well, I know for a fact, like I said, that the Ninth Massachusetts did it, and since they were the closest to the barn, they must have been one of the last ones. So one of the earlier artillery batteries must have knocked down some walls for them, and they they used that path. Then. That's better than circling around, going like that. And going out there. Thank you, Ron, for an excellent talk. And, and, uh, his book is excellent. You, yeah. you, I highly advise getting it. Thanks a lot, Mike. Linda? Since you've written your book, have you learned more information about the hospital or what happened to your family farm? I've learned isolated stories of, since the book came out, I've learned isolated stories of other men who were there. I went to Hartford, Connecticut. I didn't use him in this presentation because it was hospital oriented, but I learned about what he saw. I have his quotes. Um, descendants of guys who worked there have sent me photos of them and their stories. I have another guy, Henry Sees, who I didn't use in this talk because this was military. Henry Sees, I didn't have this in the book, was a sergeant from Ohio a lot of these guys didn't want their family members to know how seriously they were wounded. So he wrote to his brother back in Ohio and said he had his leg amputated, but he was under chloroform and he's doing very well. And he hopes mother doesn't worry. Uh, but then he died a week later. So I, I hear, I'm hearing more stories like that. In January, almost two years after the book came out, I decided to try to find descendants of George and Elizabeth because I didn't really know any of them. And I found a few dozen most of whom didn't know they were descended from George and Elizabeth Spangler. And so we had a big reunion of some of them, of uh, Harriet's descendants, Harriet's the oldest daughter. We had about 45 people at the farm for that. And then we had uh, four of Sabina's, the number two child, four of her descendants come in. And Daniel, the third child, his great grandchild drove in from Kansas. Um, we've had hospital workers, descendants come in so I'm finding things off and on. And it's been the most fun has probably been finding the descendants. And like the 45 I had at the farm that one day, I asked them to raise their hand if they knew a year ago that they were descended from George and Elizabeth Spangler and not a single hand went up. So I think that's a lot of fun. I didn't see any additional questions online. Yes, and I think that's a great point. Uh, this why the Spanglers didn't really talk about it after what they went through. I think they did just want to move on and rebuild their lives. I, I don't know because I wasn't there, but I would think this would, this would have hurt them. They would have felt this for the rest of their lives, what they went through. They're in that house, the six of them in one bedroom with a chamber pot, and there's wounded and dying union officers filling the rest of their house. Um, the barn is 50 yards away from the house. You can hear them in screaming and crying and groaning, and they're covering their heads with a pillow at night just to try to get a little bit of sleep. As the whole army of the Potomac almost is seemingly right on your farm and the, and the cannons are going off. I mean, it sounds like shell shock to me and I think they didn't write about it. I, that's one of the reasons I tried to contact, contact descendants because do you have any letters? Do you have any photos? Whatever you can have from George and Elizabeth or any of the kids, they don't have anything. And I think they were shocked and they were depressed and they just, they went through something and it was time to rebuild. So that's what they did. 
and they didn't tell everybody all their woes. They just did it. Is there any evidence of other spangler spangler relatives and the get it helping one another? I think that there was a lot of that. I have no evidence of it. Um, George had brothers. George had a couple of brothers who lived out by the cavalry battlefield, the East Cavalry Battlefield, and they were their farms were more like witnesses of the fight and weren't really impacted. And there were other Spanglers who lived all throughout Adams County. Without a doubt, I'm sure they helped. Even when the hospital was there at their farm, citizens were constantly bringing in food, clothing, scraps for them. So I think the Spanglers lived off the Christian Sanitary Commissions through November of 63 till they left town. Spanglers had money. Gettysburg had trains. I'm sure they bought money then on the trains. And then they got there. George said he got his farm going quicker than he thought he would. So they, by 1864, he's got his crops going again. He's probably purchased more animals. Yeah, it took him a lot of help to get there, but there was a lot of help available. And again, by eight, the 1870 census, only Benaya of the four kids is living in this house. The other three kids have moved out, but he added on to the house. He added on another whole third because he could. He could, have, he could afford it and he wanted the space. So he did. So he was something else. You know, this guy was a community leader a church leader, a school leader. He's president of the township school board. He's on the Evergreen Cemetery board that voted no Confederates buried in Evergreen Cemetery. He's a justice of the peace. He's on the almshouse board. He's on everything. So he was, he was quite the man that was quite the family. I have two quick questions, I think. <clears throat> the main access to Spangler Lane is that where the present road that actually yes. is farm? Is that where that is? Yes. The main, the main lane, the main access to the Spangler farm is here. And it's in the same place as it was in 1863. And these walls are still here, but they're kind of buried. And I hope that the foundation can unbury them someday because these are witness walls. Now, I don't know this, but you can't get ambulances coming and going on this little lane that can only hold one wagon. There's got to be another lane in and out somewhere. Um, I know that the artillery reserve came in down here and then made a right turn onto the farm. So maybe later on the ambulances exited or entered there or up here somewhere um, because this lane wouldn't have been enough. So somewhere over here, and I don't think we'll ever know this, they had another path then. And, and the second question is, um, and, I, and I, some of this depends on interest as well as available reserve. Are you planning on doing any kind of sequel or arrangements? Um, the publisher cut me off at almost 400 pages. <laughs> he said, Ron, if you give me any more, we're going to make it into a second book. So I had a lot of material that I didn't use. And like I was just saying, there's a lot of material still coming in. I've begun a list of possibilities for a second book, and it's a pretty long list. And I'm going to get really serious about considering it this fall. So I'll know by the end of the year if I'm going to actually act on everything I have and pursue it. Um, I've, this was a three-year project, six, seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day. I don't think this book, the follow-up would be nearly that because most of it's in this original book. But yeah, I'm strongly considering it. Good to hear. Oh, good, thank you. Can you give us a uh, little background? How did you ever get interested in Spangler's Farm and in writing the book? How, give us the background. How did I get interested in the Spangler Farm and writing the book? I retired from full-time work in 2012. I've been interested in Gettysburg since I read The Killer Angels in like 1980. <laughs> You know, this novel I read, that, that's what drew me into Gettysburg. So once I retired from full-time work and, and in 2013, um, I started volunteering at the friend's desk, like Linda Bean does. Um, that year, Ray Matlock, who's in charge of the volunteers, says, 
Ron, we have George Spangler Farm ready to open. Can you help us by being a guide? And I said, sure, but what's the George Spangler Farm? <laughs> he told me, I tried it, I liked it. I learned more every year. And by 2015, I'm asking the Gettysburg Foundation, the owners of the farm, where is the book? Who wrote the book on this? I want more information. And they said, there is no book, you, you need to write it. So in 2016, I started researching and writing, but what helped me and what probably saved me six to nine months is people like Wayne Motts and Dan Welch had done research and Kathleen George Harrison of the Park Service, but all of their research was in boxes and notebooks upstairs at the visitor center. It's just hidden away. So Cindy Small of the Gettysburg Foundation grants me permission to spend two weeks upstairs at the visitor center going through these few notebooks. That got me rolling. That, like I said, that could have saved me six months of work. And so I just took that, went from there. And by 2019, three years later, it was, it was out. It was fun. It was all consuming. Of all the things that still need to be done, the George Spangler Farm, what is the top priority? For improvements? Yes. I will first say how much they've done. It's incredible. If you've ever seen it, Mike would know, Linda would know, Guymans would know. Um, let me show you a picture. That's what the barn looked like when the Gettysburg Foundation purchased the 2008. There were three feet of manure on that bottom floor from one wall to the other wall. And that's gross, but worse, it had rotted the beams. So they had to replace the bottom with some vertical beams. Um, and then they turned that into 1863. And they did it with such seriousness that they used you know, hair, horse hair in the mortar back when they built these big, beautiful Pennsylvania bank barns. So the foundation did that too. When they rebuilt the barn into what it is today, they used horse hair in the mortar. Um, they redid the summer kitchen, they redid the smokehouse. They turned the house into a modern conference center and offices. If you wanna know what 1863 looked like, look at the new barn, look at the new summer kitchen, look at the new smokehouse. The Gettysburg Foundation deserves so much credit. I mean, they paid 1.85 million for 80 acres in 2008. And that was a steal because the family living there, the Andrew family wanted them to have it because developers were after it too. But the Gettysburg Foundation doesn't jump in and say, this is ours. And the Andrew family says, this is yours. It's a housing development, the stop signs and roads right now. So I can't really say it needs much anymore because they've done so much. I have little itty bitty unimportant things. Like I mentioned the, the rocks along the lane, I would love it if they were dug out and exposed because they were there. They were there when the, the wagons came through. Um, I don't have any strong evidence for this, but I have an idea of where the amputated arms and legs were buried. Um, someday I might ask them to get some ground penetrating radar and see if it's there or if I just have zero clue of what I'm talking about. And if we did that, I don't know if they'd want to honor it, put a sign up or just know where they are. Um, but no, the, they have done so much, so much that they deserve all the credit in the world. And that's why I dedicated this book to the Gettysburg Foundation. And I thank the Gettysburg Foundation how they saved the George Spangler farm and they saved this history. I mean, it's not so special if you write a book about a place that's not there anymore. You can't go visit it. But now the things I write about, you can go see. You can go see where the amputations took place. You, know, you can go see where the artillery reserve was. You can go see everything that I talked about. And that's all thanks to the foundation. Brian has a schedule of the remaining days. Yes. 
uh, over on the table. Thank you, Mike. I have my uh, the schedule of the farm for the rest of the season that closes in mid-August. I have a sheet that had to be cut from the book for space. It tells you uh, what drugs they use at this hospital, and some of them are still used today, and it has that there. Uh, anybody wants to join the, the Gettysburg Foundation and help support causes like this, I have a brochure, and I have my own card with my email address over there, so help yourself to any of that. If you could talk to anybody and go back in time and interview them, you know, I've seen that question a lot in the Battle of Gettysburg discussion group, and I'm seeing Armistead and Lee and Meade and, uh, and Hancock and those guys. Guess who I would pick? George Spangler. <laughs> I would want I would want to know what he saw and what he did. Again, they didn't write about what they did. I read in Harriet's obituary that after uh, Fred Stowe was moved out of the summer kitchen that they baked bread for the wounded. I have a feeling that they washed clothing and linens in a big pot in the front yard. But I would like to know what George Spangler did and what he saw and what he felt. That would that would be my high point. That would be Gettysburg. Yes. How long did it take to evacuate the to evacuate it? To, oh, to send out, carry out the wounded Oh, I don't think that took that long. Maybe an hour or so, two hours. I don't know. You know, there were four, at least 400 men in that part. <laughs> everybody, doctors, everybody is carrying them. Every, every hospital worker is carrying them. They only needed to carry them to the other side of the barn because no shells hit well, no, on this I mean, side of the barn. I mean, the wounded men that are in this hospital. Well, there aren't any wounded men lying behind the barn at this point. But aren't there five after Oh, are you talking about toward the end of the hospital? Yes. Okay, sure. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Sorry. It's a hospital for five weeks and two days. Oh. Yeah, five weeks and two days. The last guy was carried off on August 6th. A lot of them were taken to Camp Letterman. Some of them were put on a train, they got on a wagon and taken on a train to Whittlestown. Yeah. What, what I understood from reading about Gettysburg is that after the battle was over, people were just Yes. And they could smell it for yes. miles before they got there. And they were bringing food and they were looking for yes. family members and they were trying to help out and bringing supplies. But the problem, too, of the many problems, the railroad bridges had been burned down by the Confederates. So the train in Gettysburg, it doesn't start working again until like July 7th. So that's when they can really get serious about uh, getting some guys out that could be moved. A lot of guys just couldn't be moved yet. And it wasn't until a week to a 10 days after the battle that the last of the Confederates were buried. So can you imagine in those storms and that heat and humidity and those bodies are lying out there and the horses, they have to bury all of the horses and, and then some of them are being burned and the smell is so horrific that the people in town have to keep their windows closed and they have to wear a mask. And, but I will say after a while, I, I read some place where um, the citizens just kind of got used to the dead bodies and they went on with their work and did what they had to do. But you know, these people are all having to clean out their houses too. Some of them had to beat doctors and nurses in their own home without a real doctor there. But once Camp Letterman opened, like around July 20th, somewhere in there, uh, the ambulances took most of the men who could be moved over there. And so there weren't many men left at Spangler by the end of July. How was the health of the Spangler family? Was it affected to that shorten their life in any way? No. Or they remained healthy? They remained healthy. George and Elizabeth both died at age 88. Benaya, 
made it to his 80s. Daniel made it to his 90s. The only one was Harriet, the oldest. She had got consumption, which is tuberculosis, I think. Um, she's in her early 60s. George dies in 04. Harriet dies two months later, and then Harriet's daughter dies a few days after her mom. So Elizabeth Spangler loses her husband and her daughter and her granddaughter in two months time. So, but you know, that was normal for back then. They, Daniel only had two sons, one of them drowned. Beniah only had one grandchild and he didn't make it past infancy. So Beniah has no descendants today. It's the way of the world back then. When they purchased the property, I'm looking at this picture of the barn. Um, were there any battle scars? Um, shell hit on the ground the other side or in the house? Um, for the foundation owned it, it was in private hands for five or six separate owners for a lot of years, all of whom you know, allowed searches for that. So I think a lot was found. Uh, I know along Blacksmith Shop Road, a lot was found like from guys marching down the road. So a lot was that stopped uh, once the foundation bought it. I was excited two or three weeks ago, right in front of the barn, I found a, a square headed nail, which would have dated back to when the farm was built. I mean, I've been out there since 2013 and never found anything. And then this nail pops up, a, a legitimate nail from the time. Daniel Spangler, child number three, went out in the field after everybody left and he found a bayonet and a musket and a sword. He took him to Kansas with him. Um, but after he died, his family sold the sword and the bayonet, but they, the family still has the musket. His, uh, Daniel's grandson, who's still alive, has the musket and he wants to donate that to the Gettysburg Foundation. So it's just a matter of making arrangements to get that musket to Gettysburg from Kansas. So yeah, I'm with as much as covered that field, I'm sure there was so much, so much. Yeah, I was, I was actually speaking less of artifacts found on the property as opposed to structural damage to the barn. No, the house. Um, no, because they never got hit. They never got hit. The damage was from the use of the hospital with the blood and the feces and the other bodily fluids and the, the smells and like the lighteners who owned the other part of Powers Hill, they couldn't move back because it made, made their wife, his wife sick. So they tried to move back and they tried to clean it up. He said he gutted it from top to bottom, but it still made his wife sick. So the stray shells that came over, never hit the corn or anything, it just landed. Mm -hmm. And obviously some of the shells would have exploded over the, the fields too. But the one that hit within 20 feet, I think, was a ball. I think uh, you have, have been exposed to many of the wounded. No, you, you don't know of anybody that was wounded, like once they were brought there. I've heard reports of staffers, hospital staffers being wounded once they got there while they were working. I haven't heard of any wounded. I've just heard stories of these guys being crammed so closely together in that barn, almost shoulder to shoulder, that they were dying of diseases, infectious diseases that were being passed around among them rather than the battle wound that brought them there. But no, not as far as. Uh, I heard of one or two guys and some animals, but that's all I heard. Getting hit. Probably more did occur, but it was not reported. Yeah, that's the whole thing. I mean, if it was that amount of congestion. Yeah. That's the whole thing with the Civil War and that hospital. The Sanitary and Christian Commission said there were 1,900 guys treated there. I went line by line at the archives and came up with 400, 1,435. But to show you how accurate they were at the archives, they didn't have Armistead, they didn't have Barlow, they didn't have Stowe. So they just missed a lot of guys somehow. But that's another thing I want to do is go back and do more, even more research at the archives.
Good. Well, thank you very much again. Okay. And I think we'll have a few minutes if, uh, if anyone's interested in buying Ron's book tonight. And otherwise, uh, we'll see everyone next month. Thank you.